Downing Street offers householders thousands of pounds to say yes to fracking. A cheap bribe or putting you, the people, in charge. Good evening. The shale gas revolution has never got off the ground in Britain, but today the Prime Minister promised local residents if they gave the go-ahead to fracking, they'd hit the frack pot, getting direct cash handouts worth thousands of pounds. Labour dismissed the move as a bribe. In education, though, the PM wants to turn the clock back 20 years with a new generation of grammar schools. But how does that fulfil her promise to govern for everyone, not just a privileged few? Also tonight, as hundreds of thousands trapped in Aleppo celebrate the arrival of supplies, we ask the doctor who's risked everything to stay if rebels have really broken the siege. And in Rio, officials confirm all Russia's Paralympic athletes will be banned. Moscow says it's appealing the decision. So residents affected by fracking developments will be able to claim cash payments from a billion-pound shale wealth fund set up in November. Theresa May said she was rewriting the rules so local people could get a personal share in the proceeds, which could be around £13,000 for some. But environmentalists have dismissed it as little more than bribes, claiming it would only heighten community tensions. Tim Bouvery reports. A sleepy afternoon in the English countryside. But not long ago, this part of West Sussex was filled with clamour and controversy. Fear of fracking sparked the Battle of Balkan, in which protesters demonstrated forcefully against energy firm Quadrilla. Since then, plans to tap Britain's shale gas supplies have stalled. But in a bid to kick-start the process and overcome local opposition, the government are now proposing to offer five-figure payouts to affected households. The protesters have gone from this site in Balkan, as for the moment have Quadrilla, something seen as a victory for those who demonstrated so hard against even the suggestion of fracking. The question now is whether cash handouts would make a difference to local residents. Do you think that would make a difference? With me, yeah. I'd, I'd like that amount of money, yes. But I'd, I'd, I'd leave the area straight away. So you'd take the money and run? And run, I would, yes. I probably would personally, but I think there are some kind of quite strong activists around here that, would, that money's financial incentive isn't important to them. They kind of have the belief it's the wrong thing to do. But I think for a lot of people, you know, there is a financial incentive and that would help them kind of be on board with it. Oh, I've no doubt that it will change people's opinions. I mean, money talks, but at the end of the day, that's a short-sighted way of doing things um, because once the problems begin to happen, I think £13,000 won't look like a, a decent deal. I don't think it will work at all. People are far too bothered about the environment, their health, the future for their children. And what does bribery mean? It means there's something wrong. That means that they need an inducement. But £13,000 is a lot of money. It is, but in many cases, is that going to even cover the cost of insurance for the houses over, about, over the sort of a length of time? Theresa May says that this is part of her plan to create a Britain which works, and in this case pays for everyone and the scheme may even set a precedent for other government programmes. But Labour say it's simply a bribe. The government's trying to set neighbour against neighbour in order to ensure that we go down this dirty fossil fuel fracking route. Um, they're not doing the same for onshore wind, for example, where, again, there's people locally who don't like that. Um, but that would at least be a clean, green, low-carbon future. Nine days ago, Theresa May shocked the political and business worlds by delaying a decision on whether to go ahead with a new nuclear power station at Hinkley Point. And what many are wondering now is whether today's announcement is part of a wider move by the government to promote other non-nuclear sources of energy. Well, Theresa May's statement on fracking today made clear she saw it as part of her pledge to govern for everybody, not just a privileged few. So how does the other policy change under consideration by Number 10 fit in with that? The PM is considering lifting the ban on grammar schools imposed by Tony Blair's government 18 years ago. That would mark a major shift in education policy, allowing schools to select pupils with an entrance exam. 
Supporters say it would boost social mobility, but Labour and the Lib Dems say the vast majority would be worse off and they'll do all they can to oppose it. As for the Education Secretary, Justine Greening, she says she's open to the suggestion, which leaves the door open to change. Well, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP and former grammar school boy himself, Chris Philp, and the education campaigner, Fiona Miller. Chris Philp first. Theresa May stood on the steps of Number 10 just a few weeks ago and said, and I quote, she was driven not by the interests of the privileged few, but she was on a mission to make Britain a country that works for everyone. If she gets away on grammar schools, the privileged few will be able to tutor their kids from the age of God knows what, and they'll be able to make the system work for them. Well, I can only speak from my own experience. Um, my dad grew up in Peckham. He went to a grammar school and went on to become an archaeologist. I went to an ordinary state primary school in South London. I made it to a grammar school and got to Oxford and now Parliament. That's Peckham to Parliament in two generations. I think that we do need to make sure um, the widest possible range of people do get access, but actually creating more schools um, will help that happen. There should be positive outreach to make sure that those um, from the most disadvantaged backgrounds do benefit as well as the ones who get tuition, as you said. Well, Fiona Miller, let's mm. put that trajectory that Chris yeah. has described from Peckham to, to Parliament. Um, is the most meritocratic solution, potentially. Well, the trouble school. is that anecdotal stories of individual cases do not make for good policy. We, we, there's always been examples of people who come from underprivileged backgrounds who got to the grammars, but the evidence from the 1950s and 60s and today is that generally they educate a more privileged intake. Um, as Michael Wilshaw, the chief inspector of schools, said, these are, they're stuffed full of middle-class kids, and therefore I think Theresa May's claim that she, her government will be not for the privileged few is absolutely a nonsense, because grammar schools exist for the privileged few. Well, Chris, let's put some of that data to you. I mean, the FT data, they did a whole analysis of this. Poor kids were less likely to score very highly at GCSEs in grammar school areas. So the comprehensive schools end up suffering. Well, I think we need to do more to make sure kids from disadvantaged backgrounds do go to grammar schools. When poor children from those backgrounds get into grammar schools, they, all the studies show they spectacularly outperform what they would otherwise do. But what about the others that didn't you... get in and they're at the comprehensive schools? Well, yeah. just... So hang on, well, let, me, let me ask that. We need, to, we need to make sure we look after them. The pupil premium is there to give more money to schools who help those children and we need to make sure we get the best teachers in and so on. So you're right, we need to focus on those, but we don't, it's not either or, we can do both. It's an absolute myth to say that you can have comprehensive schools alongside grammar schools. Comprehensive schools are all ability schools. If you have grammar schools, you have secondary modern schools and the majority of children go to them and nobody is campaigning to bring back the secondary modern. In, indeed, the reason that the grammars went in the first place because so many middle-class parents were upset that their children were being branded as failures at 11. Well, to be clear, we're not proposing the wholesale reintroduction of the 1944 Butler Act. All I think that's being proposed is to allow schools, if they choose to, to start selecting or new schools that set up to do the same. So we're not talking about a return to the yeah, 1960s. There's no such thing as a little bit of selection. Once you start having selection, the other schools in the area suffer. And it's internationally proven the best system for all children to achieve well is an all-ability comprehensive school. Well, look, I mean, so we have a social mobility problem in this country. Social mobility was higher in the 50s and 60s and 70s when we had grammar schools. It's gone down now. Not because it's a, the it, is a, it is a disgrace that 70% of judges, over half of FTSE 100 chief executives and leading journalists, were privately educated. And the grammar school system, if done properly, without Can reach, just, which okay. is important, is an opportunity to fix that. We have just another fact. In 1959, 9% of pupils got 5O levels. 9%, that's not social mobility. Now it's around 60%. Comprehensives may not be perfect, but they have delivered opportunities to many children who didn't get them before so under grammar why schools. Not, why not let a thousand flowers bloom? You've got free school you know, have some more grammar schools, you keep the comprehensive schools. Mm -hmm. Because you can't have comprehensive too. schools and grammar schools at the same time. Comprehensive schools have to be all ability. If, if one school takes 30% of the most able students, the other school can't be all ability. That Let's is let a big all, problem. all the flowers well, bloom, well, well, but well, 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 fair admission. Well, actually, the evidence from around the world, for example, in Germany, which has a, a three-tier selective system, actually does a lot better than the UK. And I don't accept this thesis that somehow the brighter kids um, should be used as uh, academic buoyancy aids. And I don't accept the thesis that schools at, that aren't selective um, will be left to fail. With academies and the, um, the pupil premium, that won't be the case. Can I just say that Germany has one of the most segregated education systems mm. in the world, and that's what we're trying to avoid. What Theresa May says she doesn't want is a segregated society. Your group, Comprehensive Future, yeah. challenged, put a, did a legal, legal challenge yeah. in Kent when there was the talk of extending <coughs> grammar schools there. Would you do a legal challenge for this if there's a more broader rollout? Well, it, it wouldn't be a case for a legal challenge. There would have to be a change to primary legislation mm -hmm. because the, 98, the, the Blair Act in 1998 
expand any new grammar schools. If you're going to open new grammar schools, then you'd have to repeal that legislation. This is going to go to Parliament and there will be a fight, I can tell you, because there are a lot of people in your party who are not keen on grammars and there are a lot of people outside and there will be a lot of head teachers in comprehensive areas who will be absolutely horrified by this You don't think she'll get it through the Commons? I don't know, but I think there will be a fight outside and there will be a lot of people campaigning against this because it is a really retrograde step. Chris, a very quick one to you on fracking. Is it a bribe, this? No, it's not. It's making sure that the proceeds of, of uh, this ex quite exciting new opportunity are shared widely throughout society. So it is consistent with the Prime Minister's vision of making sure these sort of financial benefits are widely held. I think it's a good idea. Chris Philp, Fiona Miller, thank you very thank much you. for joining me. Now, rebel groups in Syria say they've broken the month-long siege of Aleppo for the first time after days of fierce fighting. If it's true and they manage to keep control of a key supply route into the city, it would be a major boost for the insurgents who've been under intense bombardment by Syrian and Russian forces and relief for a quarter of a million people who've been trapped in East Aleppo with dwindling supplies, as Jane Deeth reports. Joy and relief. Rare things here. Is there finally a way out for people in the anti-Assad half of Aleppo, cut off and bombarded by the Syrian army for months? They're celebrating the news rebel fighters have broken the siege, opening up a way into the surrounded city. The road is too dangerous to leave by, though. Still, it feels like rescue. <laughs> We sacrificed a sheep to celebrate the opening of the road to the 450,000 people that the criminal regime wanted to put under siege. Now the regime is under siege. God gave us victory and we will show the regime and its Iranian militias. The fight for Aleppo is the fight for control of northern Syria. President Assad, backed by Russian air power, has been battling to keep Syria's second city. But rebel video appears to show the crucial moment when they move into a Syrian army complex in the southwest. The barracks are deserted. They smash a picture of the president. Outside, military vehicles and weapons seem to lie abandoned. But the Syrian regime denies the siege has been broken. And the rebels are only too aware it's Assad who controls the skies over Aleppo. More than 100 rebels and civilians have been killed in the last week. As rebels outside Aleppo fought their way in to rebels on the inside. And the agony of the war has been visited on another rebel-held town in the north, Millers. A field hospital was bombed, killing 10 people, three of them children. Well, earlier I managed to speak to Hamza al Khatib, a doctor at Al Quds Hospital in Aleppo. On Friday, this programme showed the journey he and his family made back into the city. I began by asking him what was going through his mind when he was there with his six month month old baby amid all that danger. The, the, the only thing that's made me uh, thinking twice about getting back to, to Aleppo uh, because. Uh, she has done nothing wrong with, with, with this life, and it's not her responsibility to be involved in this uh, in this battle. But uh, there is a lot of children. Uh, what was making me uh, strong uh, that there are, there are a lot of children inside of Aleppo city. So being a doctor and having the ability to get in and out the border uh, won't won't make me better than than those persons. So what happened to them will will happen to me and my family. It's very, very dangerous to get into the city still. Um, it is a very partial breaking of the siege, isn't it? Now what uh, the, uh, the rebels are uh, trying to do uh, is to uh, make, uh, make that road uh, wider. So they are trying to take uh, parts uh, from al-Assad regime to make that road uh, become wider. Does it concern you that the siege has been broken in part with the help of some very hardline rebels, rebels who not so long ago were affiliated to al-Qaeda? Does that concern you that they'll end up reaping the rewards, that they'll end up benefiting? Actually, I don't know if, if, it, if, it was, uh, if it's right to, to say what I'm, what, what I'm going to say, but if the siege wasn't broken uh, and the, the United Nations as we expected, 
uh, didn't do anything, uh, the whole 350,000 people will, will become Al-Qaeda and will become terrorists. Because seeing their children dying and starving uh, without helping from anyone, uh, that would, would make a, a lot of people uh, radicals uh, in, in a kind of way. Dr. Hamza Al-Khatib speaking to me just before we came on air. Now, the South African Paralympic star Oscar Pistorius, who's in jail for murdering his girlfriend, has been treated in hospital for minor injuries to his wrists. Pistorius, who's just had his sentence for killing Reva Steenkamp increased to six years, denied he tried to kill himself. Prosecutors are planning to appeal against the six-year term, calling it shockingly lenient. Huge crowds have gathered in Istanbul for a rally called by President Erdogan to condemn the failed coup. Hundreds of thousands of people packed into a parade ground, waving banners with slogans describing Erdogan as a gift from God and declaring democracy had triumphed. It's being seen as a show of strength after the West criticised the crackdown against tens of thousands of people accused of being part of the coup plot. At least 17 people have been killed after torrential rain and flash floods swept through Macedonia. The capital, Skopje, was battered by heavy rain, thunderstorms and strong winds, triggering widespread flooding. Roads and homes were destroyed, with surrounding villages also hit. The country's deputy prime minister called it a catastrophe of unprecedented proportion and warned the death toll could rise. Now, Russia says it will appeal to the Court of Arbitration for sport after the International Paralympic Committee said it would ban the entire Russian team from next month's Rio Games. The IPC declared that the country's state-backed doping was an unprecedented attack on clean athletes. Meanwhile, on day two of the Olympics, 14 gold medals are up for grabs with British hopefuls, including Lizzie Armistead and Andy Murray, in action. Well, our sports correspondent, Jordan Jarrett-Bryan, is with me now. Uh, so, confirmation of uh, the Paralympic Committee's tough stance on Russia, then? Indeed, massive news coming from the Paralympics that the Russian team will be suspended from all international Paralympic Committee events. That means the Russian team will be banned from next month's Paralympic Games. This comes off the back of the McLaren report, which revealed state-sponsored uh, state doping. Um, but it also shows the teeth of Sir Philip Craven, who heads up the IPC. Ultimately, as the global governing body for the Paralympic movement, it is our responsibility to ensure fair competition so that athletes can have confidence that they are competing on a level playing field. This is vital to the integrity and credibility of Paralympic sport. And the doping controversy in the Olympics continues as well, doesn't it? It does, yes, with uh, the Sunday Times this morning revealing that they had secret footage of the Kenyan track and field uh, manager talking about how he, in exchange for up to £10,000, was and is pre-warning uh, athletes about tests that were coming their way. Now, this is just further embarrassment, really, for the IAAF, the IOC, and, of course, WADA as well. And there's uh, been a, a fair bit of sport happening as well. Hasn't there it? has, yes. Team GB are currently competing in the women's road race. That team is headed up by Lizzie Armstead, who herself was involved in a recent uh, drugs uh, scandal. She missed three tests uh, within a 10-month 10 10 -month period. Sorry. Uh, she says what the first one wasn't her fault. Another one of those was due to a very personal time she was going through and doesn't want to reveal basically what that, what that actually was. But if they, this team does pick up a medal in this event, it will basically just cause more questions around Lizzie Armstead. Jordan, thanks very much. Okay. Staying with sport, and England's cricketers have beaten Pakistan by 141 runs in the third test at Edgbaston. Alistair Cook's team declared on 445 for six to set Pakistan an unlikely winning target of 343 on the fifth day in Birmingham. Moeen Ali took the final wicket to leave Pakistan 201 all out. England lead the four-match series 2-1 with one match to play. Football and Zlatan Ibramovic scored the winning goal as Manchester United beat Leicester to win the Community Shield at Wembley. Jesse Lingard gave Manchester United the lead after a brilliant run in the first half, but a defensive mistake allowed Jamie Vardy to equalise. An Ibramovic header in the last ten minutes made the final score Leicester 1, Man United 2. Celtic had begun their defence of the Scottish Premiership title with a 2-1 victory against Hearts. James Forrest gave Celtic the lead after just eight minutes at Tynecastle, but Hearts equalised with a penalty ten minutes before half-time. 
Celtic's new signing, Scott Sinclair, scored the winning goal with a calm finish from close range. And a reminder of tonight's main news, residents who live near fracking sites could be offered cash payments in a personal share of the benefits. But environmental campaigners say it amounts to little more than a bribe. We're back tomorrow at 7. Until then, that's Channel 4 News. Good evening.